What is it like to be Muslim in the USA? Allah, Muslim. Islam okay. is perfect, Muslims are not. Does that mean there's a conflict within Islam? None of this existed before. It did. It just it didn't happen to you. You can always be an American and be a Muslim mm -hmm. at the same time, but you end up having to choose between two values. After this food, you just want to go to sleep. Secret special recipe. I'm seeing it over here, Why did you convert? How much time you had? <laughs> <laughs> to you, that might be liberation. To me, it's not. The color of your skin, where you're from in a certain, or your tribe. This is what Islam came to remove. I choose to wear this while my sister doesn't. It's better to be Muslim in the USA versus Europe. My life and their life depends on us working together. You can't go outside, you can't drive. That's what I want to tell everybody here and everybody who is listening. Downtown Detroit, over the Detroit River to Canada. Good afternoon, guys. Quite often, the best way into a culture is through good food, a dinner table, and the right people. So today, we're gonna go out to Dearborn, a suburb outside of Detroit, primarily Muslim, and speak with a collection of Muslims from different backgrounds, different beliefs, some that don't even know each other. I can ask the questions many of us have around the dinner table. Hopefully come up with some interesting answers. Hello, how you doing, sir? Doing good, how are you? Good. Dearborn. So here's the story. This Yemeni guy named Hatim reached out. He said, Hey, Peter, I know you're looking for stories. We can do a dinner. And I said, Great idea. But I didn't want to focus just on Yemeni people. I told him, you know, bring in as many different types of people as you can. So that's all we know so far. Hatim. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thanks for coming, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Honor it. Have you, man. Come on in. And Hatim is Yemeni originally, right? Yes. From you, Yemen. you you brought you grew up here though, right? Uh, I came when I was like six years old. Okay. Okay. And we have a collection of people in here. We got people from Pakistan, people uh, from American that became Muslim. We got African American brother. We got uh, from the Yemeni side. We got from the Lebanese side and. Syrian side and from Dubai. Wow, oh, we did good, a, good collection. A good collection. Even a convert. Two, two people converted to Islam. Yeah, one, uh, one, white American, one African American. This is gonna be super interesting. It's gonna be good. I'm excited. Too, all right, all right. I, this is my first time too in a, you know, mixed, okay. mixed room. He gives lectures at our mosque. Adam. Yes. How are you doing? Peter. Peter nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Friday. I just Friday. met him Friday. He was giving oh, wow. a lecture at the mask. I said, yo, yeah. I have a dinner. You come back. He's like, come on in. Thank you so much. The shadow of Muhammad Rasulullah. So we came in on the fourth prayer of the day. And then we're going to do dinner. Allahu Akbar. What do you feel out of that? Like meditation or something? It's kind of like meditation, but like you're re-centering yourself five times a day. Just to kind of like rebalance, like remind yourself of your ultimate purpose on earth, which is like worshiping God in your place. Right. So like as you go throughout your day, you get distracted by worldly affairs, mm -hmm. check back in with your purpose and your creator, Sure. get in touch with your soul, and then get back to business. It's a break from that, right? From the technology, yeah. from the... Technology, work, family, any life stress in general. Could you imagine life without it? No, I think no. I mean, sometimes it's hard to keep up with it when you're so busy. Sure. But it's exactly what you need. You grew up in the States? <laughs> I did, yeah. Um, my mom and dad are ethnically Yemeni. Okay. Yeah. So what a group we have. You guys are students, right? Yeah, we are students. Michigan State University. What are you studying? My major is chemistry. This is my second major. The first major was HR, Human Services. And I graduated from Abu Dhabi University and UAE. Okay. And this is my second major. How do you like it? How has it been here? Uh, well, so it's uh, really good. 
The team's cooking is good, but it's not mom's cooking, right? Yeah, it's different. <laughs> <laughs> My mom's cooking too. This is your mom's cooking too? Oh, fan fantastic. I'm really interested in what's under the cover, under the hood here. This is lamb. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's like lamb. And then this is the rice. Is this Yemeni style? Yemeni, almost. Yemeni style. After this food, you just want to go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> I'm staying over here, team. I'm gonna go into food coma that I'm done. Hey, this is my. This is, I know, once somebody tastes the food, they ain't gonna know. It's my secret special recipe. So come on in, come on in, come on in, guys. All right, guys. So I was just thrown in in a nice way to the prayer immediately, as you yeah. saw. <laughs> um, we're going to sort of get a rundown of who everyone is and then get into the conversation, get into uh, the different thought processes. Right. You brought a Motley collection here, a very mixed up group. Yeah, it came together um, organically. Your sisters, okay. Oh, what is it? I, I like it. it. It's not I like it. It's not <laughs> All of you ladies were born here, right? In the I States? Was. Okay. Did anyone convert or you were born Muslim? I'm you convert. You convert? Yeah. How was that? Uh, it depends who you ask. No. <laughs> I'm asking you. So it was obviously something I wanted to do. I was in college and I started, I took some classes that had to do with Islam and then I met a lot of Muslims through like the International Student Organization, sure. like soccer, all of that stuff. Okay, what do we have here? Some lamb? Yeah, this is lamb, hummus, rice, rice. This is traditional Yemeni food, right? Yes, I think it's traditional. Okay. Very tender, juicy. Payback. Very nice. <laughs> hey, you want to be my cameraman? Yeah. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Who, whose mom cooks better though, my mom or his mom? <laughs> and this is a homemade hummus. It's not like like supermarket or, or restaurant. It's right. different. Okay, here we go, guys. Here we go. We're just going to have a conversation. It's going to be hard not to talk over each other at times. We'll try our best. I'm going to cut some of these. I want to cut the least amount because it's the most real when it's just a long narration. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask the questions. I'm sure I'll stir up a few things between different ideologies. We'll have fun with it. That's the story. And I want to keep one point here. Uh, Islam is, is all over the world. Indonesia is the most populated country in the Islamic world. world. We're not representing everyone. That's impossible. These are just a few angles in. I'm gonna ask the questions. I'll let them do the speaking. So, I'll start with, what is it like to be Muslim in the USA? Growing up, um, being Muslim in the United States for me felt like a privilege. Um, I was raised to be proud to be Muslim, proud to be black, and proud to be a woman. And that's what my father instilled in me. And so that's carried with me my entire life despite the trials or the obstacles that have come. I do remember 9-11, and if I had to be quite honest, I was very empathetic toward Muslims in general, but I think that a lot of my Muslim friends understood what it meant to be black growing up in America. So it wasn't a switch for me after 9-11, it was just another facet of life. Right. Um, so today, being Muslim is something I wear proudly I'm not ashamed. I wear it like a badge of honor. And there's some days that, you know, that's, that's a trial, mm -hmm. but I use it as an opportunity to engage people, to um, in, uh, inform them, um, and open up the dialogue where some people may be closed mind or have the wrong concepts about Islam and about okay. Muslims in general. Do you do you all have non-Muslim friends? Mm -hmm. Is that we common? Non-Muslim families. Yeah. Non-Muslim families. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know. Non-Muslim friends as well. So who converted here to Islam? One, two. Okay. That's that's. Dan, a... Dan actually uh, credits one of my brothers as one of the uh, people who converted him. Dan, why did you why did you convert? How much time you have? <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's go short version, just because we have so many people like what was the catalyst this is gonna sound really s sort of dumb but um, from the first day that I learned anything about Islam to the day that I converted was six days wow. Wow. Allah took me by the hand 
Were you Catholic before? I was, and I was doing Eucharistic adoration on Fridays at three o'clock, right up to the day I gave. Wow. wow! Wow! So, it what was, what did you see in Islam that could bring you over so quickly? Well, uh, uh, we were talking about it a little bit earlier um, that the, actually the Jews, he's not Jewish, but Jews <laughs> and Christians. And Muslims, we all share so much. Right. And a lot of the fear that uh, people here in our country, I can't speak for other places, but is lack of knowledge. Yes, right. And by lack of knowledge, creates fear. Right. Is there a difference, a big difference between Muslims in the USA versus Muslims in other parts of the world? Or does that just sort of like level out because you're all Muslims? Or tough to say? So I think it's, there's two things. So one is I obviously became Muslim in the United States. And so I was like growing up in Islam around Muslims who mostly were born in the United States and in the same community that they were in for a lot of it. And so it was really interesting to me when I went to study abroad in Jordan, which is a Muslim majority country. And I was sure. there and I'm at the university and the women are, you know, there's a variety of women there. Some are covered, some aren't covered, some are in Abaya, some are in a cab, whatnot. And I was in the cafeteria and one day I was like, I, I gotta go pray. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I'm pray? Like, you know, like Allahu Akbar, like, you know, like five times a day. And they sure. were all like, you're gonna do that at school? And I was like, well, what do you mean I'm gonna do that at school? What do you, like, what are you talking about? Cause I, so it was like this like weird reverse culture shock for me. Because in the United States, what I saw and part of what attracted me to Islam was that people would literally stop everything and go pray. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to a Muslim majority country, it was the opposite. And so I handled, I was with the international student organization at my university and a lot of the Muslims that came to the United States said, we almost consider ourselves converts because when we came to the United States, we actually learned what Islam was and we stopped taking it for granted. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't learn much until college. Mm -hmm. I, I read the Bible more than I read the Quran growing up. But you I grew right up the street from a masjid. Yeah, but it was different. No, I'm, I'm saying... Because it was like you, the old did. guys did that. I, and I, yeah. I just felt like it was concentrated. Yeah. Here we had, you know, uh, an, a community that was concentrated with the mosques, mm -hmm. mosques and, uh, uh, you know, Sunday, or Sunday schools, Saturday schools. Or we... I think, I believe where, you know, with the whole country, if there's a, full, a country, an Islamic country, I almost feel like they take it for granted that it's just an Islamic country. You hear the Avan, we go to this, you know, um, five times a day. I've been to, I just came back from Turkey and it was beautiful. But they were like, you know, the bars across the street. Yeah, they stopped their music when the Avan came on, but everybody went to do their own thing afterwards. It they just have, felt. They have liquor in Turkey? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Except so, for Jordan. But it just felt like here we were concentrated. Uh, you know, Islam was taught to us as a, as a young age, and it was uh, it made us, you know, somewhat. I felt it was special. Like Islam was special to it. Being a Muslim here was special. We we're in the U.S. In the U.S. You know, and I feel we are fortunate to be living here in the Detroit metro. You know, if you. I don't know how it is raised as a Muslim in the 80s and the 90s in Idaho, you know. So where... this this is a very accepting area. Is that yeah, what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, it is. I mean, they're one of the biggest Muslim populations outside the Middle East. Outside the Middle East. Okay, so it's it's very easy to get by with even just speaking Arabic around here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair well, to the, say. the original question you asked is: Is there a difference between a Muslim here being born here and a Muslim? From, like an, uh, that immigrated here. Yeah. And for me growing up, there was. Our parents having come here, they were very um, holding fast to the religion and to the culture. And they instilled in us that you had to hold on to your religion and hold it dearly and guard it. Mm -hmm. And so you grew up um, very, very protective and very, um, I don't want to say defensive, but um, you guarded your religion, you guarded, you held steadfast to your, 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 identity. your identity, yeah. It's your identity. Yes, and so, um, but they, they had that in them, mm -hmm. um, and they instilled that into us, 
Um, and I see that a lot of um, immigrants that come to America, mm -hmm. they bring that feeling and that sentiment with them as well, that they're coming here mm -hmm. and they want to ensure that they're going to enroll their kids into those Arabic schools and Sunday schools and, and Quranic schools to make sure they don't lose their religion growing up. Um, are they are they proud to be American at the same time? I mean, am I proud to be American? I, sure. I am, of course. I was born born and raised here. So you can hold on to Islam, though you can hold on to Islam in America equally, or is one more of a focus in life? Or that's really hard to say. I mean, are you a Christian or are you an American? You I know? would say American first because I'm Protestant, but I don't practice. But you're both, right? So I'm you both. You can't say I'm one or the other. Right. And so I would say I'm both. I okay. can't say I'm neither or, or whatnot. I was in the UAE like a month ago. Yeah. And I have a lot of relatives there. And my aunt was kind of talking to me about, oh, are you losing your identity there? I'm like, you know, Hala, which means auntie, mm -hmm. like, I'm a better Muslim when I'm in America than when I'm in the Muslim country, like, legit. And I think because, What do you, you know, mean by being a better Muslim? You're praying yeah, more, like, more disciplined? Or? Yeah, I'm more disciplined, and I think because I'm proud to be both, I, like, honor the values of both, but there, it's like everyone does take it for granted. It's so easy to, you're not, like, trying to hang on to your identity, so you get too comfortable, and you get really lax, and you know, you kind of lose the value to your faith when you're in an environment there. But when mm -hmm. you're in an environment where you have to hang on because you're kind of going against the grain and you have to resist losing your identity, you value it more. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to really learn the faith for what it is. And then there's the aspect of diversity too, right? So when you're in a diverse environment mm -hmm. and you have to, you know, get along with your fellow, you know, brothers and systems, or sisters who are Muslim, you need to focus on the universal fa values in the faith and not get distracted with like the cultural baggage of the different countries. So you Does a lot of the cultural baggage go away? So for example, in the Middle East, there's a lot of hot spots, right? And there could be a, a Shiite Sunni issue perhaps in a country. When people come to this country, does that stuff sort of go, you're all Muslims, the past is the past, or do those things sort of hold on still? It depends, some of those things hold on, Mm -hmm. But it just depends on the communities too and the concentrations of like different okay. cultures and things like that. Okay, and this is a very softball question, but not everyone understands Islam. You're not wearing a headscarf. Mm -hmm. You're wearing, why, why is that? Is it a choice? Is it accepted in this environment? It's a personal choice. So. Okay. We're sisters. You're sisters. Yeah. Same mom and dad. <laughs> okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. So you chose not to, your sister chose to. Yeah. <laughs> that was interesting when you all uniformly said uh, it's better to be Muslim in the USA versus Europe. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing up a headscarf issue with France earlier. Um, has that changed at all? Say, let's just say in the last few years, do you think it's more accepting here? Less so? And I'm going to go to the men. The surprise of this evening is it's not. the women have taken over the. It, it's, why is it a surprise? Actually, that, that yeah, question. Why is it a surprise? Why? Are because you assuming because we're Muslim women that we would be docile? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Whoa. 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 I'll, I'll let it pull. I'll let it pull. Ready? Go. <laughs> it's a. It's a. I guess it's um, a common thought that in more traditional societies, which you'd be considered more traditional just by being religious, that the men would take over the conversation. I had this with the Hasidics. I had this with the Amish. The Amish surprised me because it was like this to some degree. My mom even she said she, she couldn't believe the uh, Amish women were talking. She had this preconception <laughs> that they wouldn't speak. You know, my, my parents converted to Islam. So my aunts, everybody else is Christian. And my aunt, I still catch her saying stupid stuff about Muslims sometimes, even when I'm like sitting right there. Like she'll say, you know, like, oh, I'm surprised that a woman can go out. And I was like, auntie, like, why? You know, me. Well, you, know, you gotta understand you know what the messaging is in this world. The messaging is the people know about Muslims through the mainstream media. That's 99%. Sure. That message is exactly what your auntie says. Unfortunately, this is the reality. I think it's because she sees me more as black than Muslim sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. I worked in, in corporate for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a supervisor who was a female who would give like horrible like recommendations and whatnot. So she, one day I, I went to her supervisor. I'm like, oh, this is, this is not making sense. 
She said, you know, this whole time she thought it's because you were Arab men, you, don't, you, you, don't, you guys don't listen to women. Mm. Like, you know, so we're like the pinnacle of masculine, uh, what, are they, what it's yeah. called? Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, so like, no, had, if she had great idea, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the stuff would, would come up and it mm -hmm. would be like, you know, you're, it's backwards. It doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. It doesn't flow right. And, uh, and I think it's more, uh, more, of a, it was more of a culture thing. Okay. Being Islamic, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. being a Muslim, you know. It's just a matter of looking at it from the lens of the religion. Okay. It's so looking at being an American or being from a different tribe or different culture. So you can always be an American and be a Muslim mm -hmm. at the same time. But sometimes you end up having to choose between two values. And obviously as a Muslim, you have to pick the value that goes according to Islam and as a Muslim. So, and also something very good what about... What would be an example of that? Um, you see, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fornication Forni and alcohol is, is a common culture, but in Islam, it's not allowed. So, oh, do they? Okay. Yeah. But so, what would be another example? Because I, I don't drink, I choose not to drink, and I don't yeah. think I'm going mm -hmm. against the Drug culture abuse. at all. Drug abuse? Something like that. That's well, an example. I think so, what you're looking more for, like, like, in some Arabic countries, women can't drive. Well, they can now, but they couldn't have businesses. They couldn't run for office. That's not in Islam. That has nothing to do with Islam. That's, that's a cultural that's thing by the, the nation Saudi state, or right? the nation state, whether it's Yemen or Saudi or anywhere Which else. Which crazy, what's happening in Saudi right now is unbelievable. I was there, I did a whole video series. I did, I went with a woman driving. Mm -hmm. um, they tr the Saudi government tried to get Nicki Minaj in there to perform. <laughs> Wow. Seriously. What? Saudi just cares yeah. about money. Yeah. yeah. They, were trying, care they were trying to get Nicki Minaj in. Um, depending, and it's really real, uh, regionalized. Jeddah, that would fly. Riyadh, probably not. Um, Nicki Minaj refused because of uh, human rights issues. That's what she said. Um, but it's really interesting. They're like bashing it open yeah. right but, now. But that's... They're, the, that's where the issue of, of culture and, and, and uh, religion, you know, clash. Yeah. Whereas, let's say American culture, there's really nothing that clashes with Islam. You don't have to drink. Mm -hmm. You don't have... What, yeah, what would be an example of something in America, American culture clashing with Islam? There, is there, there anything? There really isn't. Whereas, nothing. whereas in, 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 let's say from Yemen, there is a lot of cultural issues that you would say, hey, this is really way too much. It has nothing to do with the religion. Well, maybe hijab. Like, hijab, right? So traditionally, you wouldn't think that this is American culture. But I identify as Muslim American, and I, I choose to wear this while my sister doesn't, right? So it's it's the choice between the faith teaching versus mm -hmm. the culture, right? But then there are other, you know, extremes maybe you'll see in different countries, like the example that he had mentioned about maybe in certain countries women don't have rights, right? But as a Muslim woman, if I were to follow my faith, I can liberate myself from that by saying, well, God gave me the right to own my own property, to work, to you know get my own inheritance. And Education. These were rights, yeah, that were given to Muslim women 1,400 years ago at a time that like women in Europe didn't have. Women you know, didn't have the right to vote in the US a couple hundred years ago, 1,400 even, years ago. Do you feel like there's anything in, in, the, in the government here that could threaten Islam, like you're pretty free to practice your religion. The Amish came here from Switzerland because of religious prosecution. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where was the best place to go? The United States, they could be left alone. Is there anything do you think that's changing or you could foresee changing Honestly, in the government? Uh, here? Unless they decide to do the, the, that list that they wanted to do back uh, in 16 or 17, where they wanted to have a, a, a registry. the registry. Oh, wow. That was the only thing I, I would think, think that of. would be the only but, thing but, I could think but of. But once they do that, they'll come for the Jews next and the Christians after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the first one to sign that registry. It's not even a faith-based thing. Some, some of these issues that we're facing now come from like a lens of Islamophobia. It's not because Islam is a problem. It's because people have the wrong impression of Islam. Why do they have the wrong impression? The media, lack of politics, knowledge. Lot, lack of knowledge. Like again, the example of hijab, since it's a hot topic, we mentioned earlier that so many different faiths, like of the three most common faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, they all have a concept of hijab. Yeah, everyone like, you know, freaks out when a Muslim woman wears it. And there are other faiths that practice some level of hijab. But it's only a problem with Muslims. Why? Because of Islamophobia. You've never heard of a nun, you know, being forced to remove her, her head 
wrap or her hat covering. Yeah. So what's the difference? What's the different factor in that? Equation? How do you feel if some young American woman tries to come in and uh, liberate you, let's say? Well, there, there's actually an incident I think that recently happened where a school teacher mm -hmm. took off the hijab of a young student telling her like you're seven years beautiful. old. Mm -hmm. She's seven. And yeah. I think, you know, I believe the parents are pressing charges because mm -hmm. it's like, to you, that might be liberation. To me, it's not. To me, having the power to say, uh, you don't get to see me in a way that I, I choose who gets to see me in that way, that's power. To me. Would it be the equivalent of someone taking off my shirt? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Probably beyond that. Yeah. It's okay. violation. Yeah. So Back to the government. The government, Go what you said. Let's not forget Snowden and what he uncovered. Oh, sure. And the government going in and, and, you know, spying on Americans all around, you know, the states. And let's not forget the no-fly lists and, and what they had done to us. And let's not forget all of that. So they had put people on no-fly lists. They had, you know, red mark people. My brother, when he was in med school, used to have to fly around the states to get interviewed at different hospitals. And he, every time he would have to fly, he would get held up at, in, at domestic airports every single time because his name was put on some kind of a list and he would have a red check mark every time he had to fly. And so there were, there were Muslims were labeled, they were marked, and they were gone after at some point in time. And, the, you know, it could possibly happen again. It's so still I still do. I can stop. Every time I travel, every time I travel anywhere, I'm always held up for secondary screening. Yeah, and always. you get airports that that do those those whole X-ray things, and you oh, know they violate your body and your personal space, and you know look, you know God knows what before, you have in you. You're you're all too young, but before September 11th, did any of this exist? None of this existed before. So well, I'm I'm just gonna be devils. Did, I'm gonna be devils. It did. It did. It just it didn't happen to you. Or you know, as, the, 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 the Patriot Act. Happen. The Patriot Act was not set up by by Bush. The Patriot Act was uh, enacted in '95 by Clinton, and the first person to be put in jail for the Patriot Act was Ahmad Hamad. He was head of uh, uh, the ADC, the Palestinian. The okay, what, what would you say to the argument? There are fringe people in every culture and society, mm -hmm. correct? Right? Yeah. There are some Islamic people. Look, we had September 11th. We've had other events. This crazes, creates an alert. If someone doesn't know a Muslim person, they don't have a Muslim neighbor, mm -hmm. this is all they're seeing. Mm -hmm. What's, what would be your response to that? Like ask, like, ask yourself, why is it that when there is like any kind of a crime or a mass murder or something, when the you know perpetrator is Muslim, why is the whole faith put on trial? Like mm -hmm. we had Timothy McVeigh, but yeah, the, 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 the Oklahoma, what was it, the hospital? Uh, this yeah. is the yeah. Mother, yeah. Right, and so it was like, oh, he's just a lone wolf, but if they're a person of color, if they're Muslim, they don't they don't cast it off as like oh mental, it's mental illness. Disease. It's the faith is flawed. Oh my God, the faith is a terrorist faith. Right. So any us. any bad actor that is under the auspice of Islam or anything, all of a sudden it represents everyone, which mm -hmm. is total BS. It is because the Muslims are like what the second or the third it largest the population like across yeah. the globe. We're talking about billions of people, and if it was a it's, faith it's of terrorism, <laughs> it wouldn't be the yeah. fastest widespread, and it wouldn't be we like the world. Have gone. I gotta say, of uh, <laughs> I've spent roughly an uh, not an hour, a year in the Muslim world, and if there's one area of the world that uniformly, like, offers hospitality, it's it's the, the it's the Muslim yeah, world. That's from yeah, the religion, that's from right? Religion. Yeah. Yeah. The, the prophet peace be upon him said, "He who fears God in the day of judgment shall be uh, generous with his guests." And hospitable yeah. travelers, yes. feeding people. That's what it is. Huge it's the, Muslim teaching. It's the caravan and the traveler mentality right yeah they have pretty much like rights upon people so like if you're a muslim and there's a traveler you, they have a right upon you that you help them to the best of your ability if you have a guest you're supposed to honor the guest right feeding people is like huge rewards in the muslim faith so that's why muslim culture is so big on food so like feeding people is something that we pride ourselves on i think another example of this are the largest refugee camps are in muslim countries in places like jordan and turkey um, and so as a result of the contemporary conflicts in the Middle East, you know, they're being hosted in neighboring countries. And one of the criticisms is often of Muslim countries is why don't they take care of the neighbors that are fleeing and why are they going to Europe and why is it Europe's responsibility? But there are 10 times, hundreds of times more refugees that are being hosted in neighboring countries. You know, like but the Jordan. Gulf states are traditionally pretty bad with that. They are, Absolutely, they are, but I'm not talking really about them. They don't take anyone in. Yeah, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about countries like Turkey and, and Jordan. Yemen and had Lebanon. Syrian refugees 
the last time I was in Yemen. Yeah. Before the war broke out, there yeah. was Syria Yemen is an, um, an exception. And so Somali, so uh, you know, refugees. But the, uh, no, I love the UA, but there, there's no one that's getting in there. Oh, no, no one's getting yeah. to UA, Saudi. They're, they're just not. They're, like, right. My coworkers say, I know Muslims that smoke weed. Yeah. Yes, just like I know yeah. Christians that get high at the bar and go to church on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Being Muslim don't mean we're perfect. It means we're striving to be doing what God's will, or what we think and believe God's will is. It doesn't mean that you're not going to see a Muslim woman or a Muslim man acting out of character. But the minute you see a Muslim man uh, do something wrong or a Muslim woman not wearing her hijab, oh, she fake, she's, a, she's, a, she's, a, she's not really a Muslim. Why isn't she? You know her heart, you judging her, you're judging me, and that's what happens with people. We start to judge people, right? So that's why I'm very careful, whether we're Christian or Muslim or Shia or Sunni or whatever you want to call yourselves, we're still just people. Mm -hmm. And people have flaws and people have mm -hmm. uh, human errors. And that's, a, that's so what's great about Islam because we understand that God knows that he didn't make us perfect. He's perfect, not us. So I always say people, God's word is perfect, people are not. So don't tell me you saw a Muslim man smoking weed, because you probably did. Don't tell me you saw the hijabi at the corner store buying a blunt, you probably did. <laughs> but why don't I hear Christians ridiculed about that? And I see, you know what I'm saying? It's getting high, it's like a, it's a, it's a funny thing now. It's like a com common thing being, you know, all the things, I'm saying, I'm sorry talking to you. Um, a lot of the things that I hear Muslims criticize for so st sharply mm -hmm. is that other cultures and other religions don't get that kind of um, um, scrutiny. scrutiny. Crucifixion is what I was going to say. Sorry, um, all my Christian friends. But I have family that are Christian. And I always tell people, whatever works for you. I don't. I'm not the person that's going to say because you didn't believe and pray like I did. It's only one God. I remind all my coworkers and friends. You might say Jehovah, Yahweh, Allah. Promise you, I don't pray to Muhammad, mm -hmm. peace and mm -hmm. blessings be upon him. You pray to Jesus, that works for you, that's fine. You know, I had a coworker tell me, um, uh, she don't believe in the same Jesus we did. I said, how many Jesus walked the earth? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I'm saying, you Muslims don't believe in the same Jesus. I said, Jesus, uh, and then mama's name was Mary? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but that's not the same Jesus. I said, listen, it was one Jesus that walked this earth. But you know, these conversations, if you're talking to people that want to learn and expand their mind to maybe what they've heard or what they've seen or experienced, um, then, it, then it becomes great conversation and dialogue. And you, and you, your coworkers, I mean, we talked about it earlier, but sure. I just want to mention again, you're at Ford. Yes. Your title again? I'm a power distribution electrician. So you're dealing with all types of people. I do. And you have to teach all types of people. I have to deal with all kind of people. <laughs> she <laughs> she has current at her fingertips. Watch it. Current. Well, well, I'll tell you what. What what's a great? That's a great conversation because I don't always get along with my coworkers, um, but I will tell you, and they might not always get along with me. But when it comes time to do the job, because of how serious our job is, my life and their life depends on us working together. So you'll find it real funny that any, we might have had a disagreement five seconds before we get called to a job. The minute we suit up. We're all one team. So the second there's a threat or danger, yes. all that stuff goes away. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll tolerate and smile and have his back or he'll have my back or, you know, I don't work with any women, so I would say her, but I don't work with any women. So yeah, we instantly have each other's back because our life depends on it. Well, it's funny that same application can't go outside of the substation, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we had that type of loyalty and that type of love or even care for each other outside of the substation, um, we would probably have a better uh, life and dialogue and um, foundation to grow and build and have better Maybe it's because in the U.S. Yeah. it's too, uh, despite all of the massive problems here, there's no invading army on the doorstep. You know what I'm saying? So that, just like your job, there, the invading army is that current that could kill you all. Sure. And it brings you together immediately. Sure. If there was a common threat here, as in the countries evaded, all of that stuff goes out the window immediately. Because we were, because we rely on each other. I, I like that. Um, I like that parable. Mm -hmm. But I will further say this conversation. I, like again, I was born and raised here, and I went from, you know, being a Muslim was not a horrible thing when I was growing up. And it this was, is Detroit or Dearborn? Detroit. Okay. Detroit, um, Highland Park. Yeah. So when I was growing up, being Muslim wasn't it not more. It didn't supersede the conversation of being black, and. Um, that conversation really didn't affect me or, or I never was affected about that even 
until I got into the um, corporate America conversations. I never, as a matter of fact, if I had to be honest, not really until I got into skilled trades did I feel my race was an issue mm -hmm. and my gender was an issue. I never really felt growing up that me being Muslim was an issue. Interesting, interesting. There's a flip side to that too, yeah. I'm sorry, sister. Oh, okay. uh, when I go to the masjid for the Juma prayer on Fridays, Chances are pretty good that out of 300 men and women, there'll be less than five white people. I'll be <laughs> one of four or five white You and a couple Bosnians or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of Arabic people who are very fair-skinned, okay. okay. especially as they age and the hair turns gray or bald or whatever. But um, like Sister was saying, the, these sisters were talking about the, the masjid that they belong to mm -hmm. is uh, um, has a lot of uh, black people, draws a lot of black people. In Dearborn here, we generally have um, masjids that feed the Yemeni people, the Lebanese people, you know, mm -hmm. a certain, but I'm still usually one of a very small handful that's why I tell people I'm Yemen. What I want to tell everybody is that when you look at when you look at Islam, of course, there's culture and there's other things, there's two extremes the way you look at it. One person, one extreme is you have to you have to, you know, you can't go outside, you can't, you know, you can't drive and and the other extreme is, you know, you could do whatever you want. So, and in both situations, you're always following your own desires. So does that mean there's a battle in Islam? Maybe battle's the wrong word, but conflict within Islam because some people think you should live one way and others should think you should live another. Well, the conflict is not within Islam. It's the conflict is within the person himself. So when you look at yourself and you say, okay, am I following my desires? And I'm, and I'm looking at Islam and making it fit what I want it to be. And then that's, that's, that's where I say, okay, now I'm following Islam even though I'm not. And I, and I misinterpret or I, I misunderstand, I have a pre conception about it and then if you have a preconception about something mm -hmm. and you want to research you'll find what you want to find right but they emanate from Islam mm -hmm. does it come from Islam or did it start in your misconceptions or your preconceptions so that's the way that's what I want to tell everybody here and everybody whoever is listening is you have to be sincere in that you want to do what Allah and the what the messenger have you know told us that the way we live our life we can't find we can't be saying that, okay, I want to I wanna live this way, so I'm going to make Islam fit the way I want it to live and say, okay, I'm Muslim and I'm following Islam. Mm -hmm. And the same extreme on the other side. So we have to be sincere and say, and see what does Allah want from us? And what the, how can we satisfy, live a life that Allah will be satisfied with? Mm -hmm. And rather it's this way or that way, I'm going to be willing to follow it even if whatever I have to do. Whatever I have to sacrifice, whatever I have to lose, whatever I have to do to, to be set, to make Allah satisfied with me, this is the purpose that I have in this life, and this is what I'm trying to accomplish as, as in this life. Because no matter what you do, you, there's only a few things, as the Messenger Sallallahu said, that you could take home with, that you could take with you after you pass away. Your good deeds, what you've done good for other people, and children that will, that will go on after you, that will do good, and, and, and give, give, ask God for forgiveness for your heart. When the truth is follows their desires, then everything will be will go corrupt. That's the one thing. Do you I see some say. of that happening in society now? In society, not only in society, in in American society, in Muslim society, but all over the world. And I so think, it's for I everyone it's, right now. Uh, it, I think what's and that's the other thing I wanted to talk about is is the uh, being a Muslim in America or being Muslim, you know, in in uh, the Middle East or back home. I think that that the in the back home. And, and in the Middle East, I think it's all been affected by certain ideas like nationalism and things like that. And that's why, I, well, that's why I said there's no majority and minority in Islam. So what makes majority and minority is when you have, you know, thing, uh, states that are built on, you know, your color of your skin, where you're from in a certain, or your tribe. And this is what Islam came to, to remove. The Prophet ﷺ came to remove tribalism, came to remove racism. And, and, and the, when, when the tribes of Medina were about to fight each other in front of him, he says, He says, you're calling for something of ignorance, something that I came to remove while I am with you. Leave tribalism alone, leave nationalism alone, because it is something that's disgusting and right. So there's no such thing as minority and majority in Islam. We, we look at a person is not where he's from. 
where what color of his skin where you know what his tribe is we look at what what are the ideas that he's adopted because this is what makes your personality you don't choose where you're from you don't choose the color of your skin you don't choose where you were born you choose what you believe and this is the biggest thing of personality sure. what you believe not but what else. about some countries some muslim countries where the the common narrative doesn't follow that those principles where it is very tribal i would say and if you go to the the gulf region there are certain tribes that are going to be way better off than others that's the and difference between Muslims and Islam. Like, Islam okay. is perfect, Muslims are not. Exactly. It's oh, not like gotcha, gotcha, you, gotcha. God's gotcha. word is perfect, Muslims are not. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that, you know, when you're asking about, do Muslims believe this, or what do Muslims think about this topic or that topic, it's important to recognize that Muslims are just like anybody else in the sense that we're influenced and affected by the social, cultural, political, economic, and class forces that exist within a society mm -hmm. and so within america that also includes you know for those muslims that are immigrants it includes their their background that also affects them and so you're trying to balance you know all of these different things at the one time which are part of your intersectionality uh and to try to create a world view for yourself so those world views are going to differ from person to person you know in a massive way you know and so that's why you have this huge diversity of thought and i think if you polled people here on any given topic, we'd have like various opinions on the same issue. I mean, there um, are billions of Muslims all over the world. So it yeah. just, it baffles me sometimes as to why people would think that all Muslims believe one thing or we all want to say it in one way. Like there's billions of Well, lab labels are easy. <laughs> so people say the Jews. Mm -hmm. That's the same. Judaism is Sasha, Sasha Baron Cohen in the most strict Hasidim person that's not leaving their house in New York and doesn't mm -hmm. use technology. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's a label, it's easy. Oh, the Amish are this. Okay, we gotta figure it out now because most people just don't wanna put the time in to think through it all. Because so it's hard, like when you it takes think a about lot of processing. Right? So yeah. if you think about subculture, America. We have yeah. American culture, right? The big American culture. And then within American culture, we have all of these little tiny different groups. Right. So within American culture, like you think about the goths, right? Like the people, you know, you have that weird kid in high mm -hmm. school that wears the all black and sure. you got like all the fingernails. My and wife nobody was one. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, like she's still American. She has her own little group. She has her group of friends. She has she this. It, but her. she is, <laughs> you know, she's still American though. So I just think it's interesting. Like, you know, Muslims, it's, it's a part of our culture. It's, it is a part of who I am. It is not the only thing that I am. It is a part of who I am, yeah. and it's always going to be a part of who I am. And um, but I wouldn't expect anybody else just because they're Muslim to think exactly the way that I do. On great, everything. great point. Great yeah, point. I, too, I think yeah. this is a really important point because it is, you know, as you guys are saying, it's a big part of our identity. For some, it's a smaller part of our identity, but it is a part of your identity. The slow death of the GoPro indoors. Uh, it just reached its limits, so we're going iPhone. You're from Nigeria originally, right? Yes. How long have you been here? For 10 years now. 10 years. How's it been for you? It has been great. It's been great? Yeah. You're from Abuja? I'm from Lagos. Lagos. Yeah. The big city. Yeah, the big city. So the Nigerians, all the ones I've met, have been very successful in this country. Why is that? I think because the um, majority of the parents try to push them to try their best to achieve the best when they come here. So that's the lifestyle they come in here with. And they try their best to achieve the best by going to school and achieving the best. So you guys are pushed very hard at home? Yes, in terms of education and all the aspects of life too. Because you see this place as an opportunity for you to build yourself and also to support your family, support the people around you too. So did they push religion on you just as hard as education when you were young or? Uh, depending on the families, but on average, you get that push from both sides, education and also religion also, on both sides of the life side. Will, so, will, will you stay in the US or will you ever move back, do you think? So it depends on where I get an opportunity to work or to have more support for the people around myself. So for example, um, if I get um, an opportunity to do something that I think I have an interest with in a different place, I can decide to move. So you're, you're going wherever the opportunity is? Yeah, so where I think I can help most, depending on the situation. Okay. Yeah. And have you felt like there have been a lot of opportunities for you here? Yeah, I'm going to say and do the best I can. You're doing the best you can? And do the best I can. Oh, you do the best you can. What's yeah. your profession? Or? Uh, so now I'm, I did a biomedical degree from Wayne State University. 
So now I'm just, I did apply to uh, medical schools, hoping to get a feedback from them. So start with a medical group here. Wow. Hopefully. You're gonna go to med school? Hopefully. What's that, 10 years? That's like uh, maybe seven years, maybe four, four years in residency. Depending what kind of doctor? A family medicine doctor. Oh, okay. So um, a lot of people are usually like surprised when they find out that Muslim women or Muslim women in hijab, um, visibly Muslim women, hold very high level positions. So like amongst us, you have like women in college administration or formerly in women in politics. And I think a lot of people are shocked by that because they usually have this, you know, they, they believe in this stereotype that Muslim women are, are incapable of taking on leadership roles or they're their voices are suppressed and so they can't take on those roles. I've lived in America my entire life, right? And I'm an American. Um, and I, I'm very, very irritated by a lot of um, the misconceptions or the attacks on Islam as a misogynistic uh, religion or one that, um, you know, oppresses women in general. When when I look, when I, I know about my faith and I pretty much know about my faith better than most of the people that attack it. Um, and so what I what I would like to say to those people, for the most part, is having been an American and having lived my entire life in this country and having faced um, problems in the workplace, having been in the, the political realm, um, and having seen the problems that we have in America as women, um, whether it be with, with the dress code, whether it be with glass ceilings, whether it be with leadership or progressing in our careers. The fact that America itself mm -hmm. is still, hasn't progressed um, with women itself, and yet we are attacking Islam as a misogynistic religion, that is the part that, that frustrates me that we continue to attack Islam as this chauvinistic, misogynistic religion, but we live in a country that is still decades and centuries behind where this religion has put women. We have equal rights, we have inheritance rights, we have all these rights that have been given to us as women, and we are still not there even as a country today. Where would be an example of a country where women, women have it the best? I don't think there's a country today that has, that has given women all of what we deserve. I think women in the U.S. have it pretty good in the sense that they have the freedom to practice their values as opposed to like other countries. And because I can practice my values as a Muslim woman, I feel like, you know, I personally feel like I have it pretty good here. Um, and same countries that might identify as Muslim and aren't there, I think they're lacking Islam. Like even if they're Muslim, like predominantly Muslim countries, mm -hmm. it's not that Islam's a problem, it's that they need more Islam in the way they, you know, give people rights. Um, I've never been to Malaysia, it's on my bucket list, but I've heard, and it's a Muslim country that, you know, um, is very big on the values. I've heard the women there are very um, successful, empowered, uh, extremely like happy with the lifestyle there. Um, so. I don't know too much about it because I haven't been there, but it's a cool country. I've heard, yeah, I've heard great things about it. But I want to introduce some nuance into this question or this conversation, and I think it's it's a better conversation than it is a question. The question of do Muslim women have rights in certain countries more than they have in other countries? Well, you know, we don't know because we live in America, and so it's hard for us to speak for the experiences of Muslim women in Malaysia versus Turkey, so on and so forth. But what we can say, just to introduce some degree of nuance into the conversation, is that you know there's about seven, eight, or nine Muslim-majority countries that have elected a female head of state. Some of them are quite conservative, like countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan, who've done it on multiple occasions. So you know, for us, like you know, it's it's very difficult to say whether Muslim women have rights in those countries or whether our rights are better in these in, in the West. Um, and progressive policies, you know, we're sort of scaling back a lot of. I think women's rights in America and, you know, so it's just, we have to have a little bit more of nuance when we talk about these topics. Scaling back women's rights, what do you mean by that? Sure, I mean, you know, so uh, you can think about things like, you know, states like North Carolina or Texas, which have scaled oh, okay, back. Oh, okay, that's a good example. Yeah, now sure. they're among the uh, most restrictive 
states for reproductive rights. And so that rights. that's interesting. How does that go in parallel to Islam? Because what does Islam say about abortion? Or it depends who you're talking to. Well, it, it, there, there are opinions within Islamic law about, about abortion. So first trimester abortions are largely uh, considered to be permissible within Islam. Um, and so in all Muslim countries yeah. or it depends on the country. No, so you're, 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 the scholars make these opinions, and so, okay. so it, 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 it doesn't really go by country, so it would go by like who's, who the scholars are. Madahab, yeah, uh, uh, the, the four sects of the Sunni and the, the so, so sects are his, his, Historically, it's been considered um, valid. Now, of course, Islam yeah. doesn't promote abortions, you know, I'm not saying that. But for medical reasons, incest, and you know, for rape. lots of other reasons, rape, for instance. But control. could you just have an abortion because you want an abortion? Uh, it's highly discouraged. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's where, like, it gets really interesting where, like, you know, you see, like, the hashtag, like, Texas Taliban and stuff like that. And that's where it becomes where Islamophobia is getting mixed in with politics because why are you comparing it to a religion that actually has room for abortion to be permissible? Mm -hmm. And while it's frowned upon and it's discouraged and it's not supposed to be a method of birth control and all of those things, there are situations where it would be permissible. And then if you were to look at today, you know, you have two women here that are running for public office for municipal, you know, uh, positions. Um, you've had two women that are uh, U.S. Congresswomen. Uh, you've had women across the country that have run for office now from a federal to down to school boards and things like that, representing uh, their communities. Um, you know, so there's another part of this conversation, too. So as Muslim women and men living in America, like we feel a sense of responsibility for our communities, not just for our specific religious group as well. Mm -hmm. So the people that are running for office in Dearborn, let's say, or Hamtramck, their concern is the broader uh, issues within the city, not just what's affecting the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. So to win an election... Sorry, I just... Yeah, sure. I just think you might get varied answers with, to that question too, because it goes back to the culture conversation we had, where cult all cultures are man-made, and so by default, they they have human flaws. And so everywhere you go, you're gonna have like your strengths and weaknesses or positives or negatives within each culture. So I have cousins in the UAE who when I visit, I'm blown away by the rights they have as women. Um, like they get their maternity leave is, is very different than ours. Um, they, if they're mothers of young children, they get offered a very early retirement because that culture recognizes their role as a female. And like to a woman here in the US, like to think that my career would get thrown off if I were to have kids, that's a right that I wish I had as a Muslim woman. So I think in certain ways I could say, yeah, I like it better here because I can be as vocal as I want because of like my freedom of speech rights. Um, and in other ways, I think because, you know, all cultures again are lacking to some capacity, mm -hmm. there might be things that I'm missing out on that maybe cousins I have in the UAE um, get to enjoy. Sure. So it varies. Gotcha. I mean, we're no different than any other group. You know, we, we watch football on Sundays. We, you know, basketball. We're into sports. Our kids are into sports. We're no different, you know, than any other group, really. You yeah, wear a Detroit Lions sweatshirt <laughs> and yeah. American flag we, on the sleeve. We keep getting cheated, man. Damn. But but you know, constantly rebuilding every year. We're rebuilding. <laughs> are you talking about the Lions? The Lions. I don't know football at all, but they, oh, you man. guys aren't good. We no. have done one since like 1957. <laughs> hasn't been like, a, like I, I only know that because my dad was born in 1957. It's a family um, joke. But we're up against a massive uh, force, which is media portrayal, yes, and that's really difficult to combat. You know, and so we're here sitting in this like living room having this conversation. We're trying to speak to a broad audience that's following you. And even if it's a million people, you know, there's 350 million people in America. <laughs> you know, the, the research shows that uh, largely Americans have negative perceptions of Islam. It's the least liked religion in America, you know, according to the Pew research. And so this is a big problem because it has real effects. And the impact of the media portrayal of Muslims, so you have films like you know, Zero Dark Thirty, American Sniper, you know, shows like 24 and Homeland, which portray not, not only Muslims in like a negative light, but a light in which there's something to be feared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the opening segment of the show Homeland shows Brody praying with ominous music playing in the background, and automatically in the brain of an, a typical, you know, audience member that's watching the show is an extremely negative sure. you know, association. Right. So that's what we're up against. So to your point, there is this 
profound frustration that we feel when we have to have these conversations, you know? And, and we, we wish that people would just pick up a book every once in a while. Yeah, but to, I, I agree with you on the point with the media and the portrayal and Hollywood movies. It's, I, I totally get it. It's a subconscious thing that lays in the back of people's minds. But I will also say people are busy in their lives. You, many people in this room don't know the capital of Tajikistan, sure, right? Yeah. So if or Tennessee for that matter, your, <laughs> your focus is not there. You're in yeah. your world and people should know more about Islam because it's a major mm -hmm. world religion for sure. I didn't have it in my public school education at all. I had my world, re my world religions professor opened me up to it. He was fantastic. I traveled to these places. Okay. Now I'm interested. But if someone's living a very busy life, raising kids, working their butt off, I hate to say it. The reality is they're not going to dive in. They'll yeah. watch a short YouTube video and hopefully get something out of it. Yeah. I mean, that's but, just... But what, let me, let me, the, the gentleman in, uh, uh, in Atlanta, the guy, uh, the white guy that killed a bunch of Asian uh, women, uh, uh, okay. not once did one news station say, you know, extremist Christian attacks, you know, uh, unarmed civilians or unarmed agents. Had he been Muslim, that would be the topic and it would be repeated throughout every channel. Well, CNN, like recently with uh, with the Taliban retaking Afghanistan, like there, one of the reporters on the ground was a woman and there was a group of people behind her chanting Allahu Akbar, which means God is great or God is the greatest. I see that. And she translated it to mean death to America. Oh, yes. 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 And no, that was on I see CNN. That, I see that line. And I was like, that is so dangerous because that's something that we say in prayer. So five times a day, we say it how many times? in a regular prayer. During like yeah. celebratory yeah. things. Celebratory oh, things. They'll say takbir and everyone goes to love right. Akbar, yeah. Allahu Akbar. So it's dangerous for everyday Muslims to have that kind of misinformation yeah. out there. Right. And a lot of them have more patriotism in, in, in themselves where they're like, yeah, I know all this stuff, right? What do you mean they have more patriotism in themselves? They really, like, they really love the fact that they have a certain opportunities here that they might not found, have found in their home countries. Not because of religion, but just because of other factors. It might have been uh, war-torn countries, poverty, lack of resources, famine. You know, there are so many different reasons why people come to this country. And, um, and so sometimes they really appreciate the opportunities that they have here. And it makes them really proud to be American. And so they, they take the time and they have the passion to learn what defines an American. And it's not the color of your skin. It's not, you know, where you're ethnically from. It's the values, and similarly with like being Muslim, it's, it's the values that we identify with. It's you know, there's, there, there's an old Arabic saying: you don't taste the sweet, so you've tasted taste the, the sour. sour. Yeah. And a lot of these, a lot of like our fathers and mothers and people who emigrated here, they tasted the sour. They hurt, like they felt the pain. They went through the hunger. They went like my father was an orphan at a young age. and was by by uh, uh, I think 12 years old. He was already in Kuwait in Saudi. So when he came here, it, this was like, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, like it, this. He's tasted the sour. He's, you need pain he's for pleasure. Pain. Yeah. You know. So when you come here, this really is the land of the opportunity. I know on the post where you were saying that you were coming to Dearborn, um, one of the questions someone asked was. Um, are they proud to be American or something like that? And I was like, have you ever been to Dearborn? Yeah. Because like, there's more American flags in Dearborn and Hamtramck and yep. these places that are high immigrant populations than you would find out in the suburbs where I grew up. That's, like, that's very true. It's, there's, it's very patriotic. Like before I came here, I was at a Yemeni event where, that was celebrating independence of Yemen from 60 years ago. And they probably had more American flags there than they had Yemeni flags, which was actually kind of very interesting to me, and I made note of it. And it's just one of those things. There is that pride. So when you're at political events or you're at places where, you know, people are wearing suits and stuff, their lapel pins more, more than likely are going to be American flag or, like, one of the, the dual ones. Like, it, there is that pride that so many people, like... We were talking earlier with taking things for granted, like, in Muslim countries versus in here. And I think it's that same thing where... When you've been here and you've grown up, I'm fifth generation here. So my family, like, they're still proud to be American, but it's a lot different than a first or second generation immigrant family. Right. This is the country that honored us. It took us in. It educated us. It sheltered us. It fed us. It's take care of our kids. I don't plan on living back in Yemen. I don't plan on, I'm, I'll go visit. Guys, I'm going to wrap this up. My arm's going to fall off. <laughs> and uh, it's been great. Can you make some what? Make some what? Last. Just like a
Closing statement. Okay, here yeah, we go. So, like, um, one is that, like, your Muslim faith and your American identity are not mutually exclusive. You can be both a woman and American. They don't have to conflict. And two is if you want to learn more about Islam, look at the actual faith and not necessarily the people because as humans, we all sin differently. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. You're all great. Even you guys over there, your support in the background. Yeah. I felt it. My frustration is One. that the lions keep losing. Yeah. The lions keep losing. Yeah. All right, no, guys. I get it. I'm not sure. Thank you, Hatim. Yeah. Hatim is the one. Come out with me, girl. Hatim is the one that set this up. He and his family make beautiful food, and he also has a coffee shop named uh, Gamaria Yemeni Coffee. Gamaria Yemeni Coffee. And if you haven't had Yemeni Coffee, I've been told it's the best coffee on the planet. I definitely know the honey is the best honey I've had. Definitely. Honey, uh, coffee, that's what they meant. I'll leave that link below. I'll leave your Instagram below because without Hatim, there's no way I'd get a massive group of people together uh, in this room in Dearborn and make I a video. You, man. Thank, you, Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Travel in the world and keep meeting people. All right, guys. You Hope you enjoyed that. Got something out of it. I have a few other uh, videos in the Muslim series playlist below. Thanks for coming along. Until the next one.